and the Sarah M. State of Seminar Day program. This program, plan and coordinated by the Land chapter of Factor de Kappa, with the Factor de Kappa International Study Topic for the students of Andrew College who are keeping on speaking and seminar program. This year's topic is one tears and the spirit of inspiration. Thank you for attending this important day in the life of the Andrew College. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather today and celebrate Seminar Day in Tradition at and College. Thank you for allowing us to live in a free country while we're thinking, emphasizing, and encouraged. We have so many blessings and we are so fortunate to be able to discuss ideas and thoughts without fear. Please, please be with us today as we explore new thoughts and traveling new directions. I am Veronica Carroll, Public Relations Officer in Phi Theta Kappa. The Theta Lambda Chapter of Phi Theta Kappa is holding the Community College Completion Pledge Project this spring semester. This project, done in conjunction with the International Phi Theta Kappa Office, encourages all two-year college students to complete their associate's degree. Many two-year college students transfer to other institutions, and then circumstances force them to drop out of college. Having a two-year college degree ensures a college student of success, no matter the circumstances. The Theta Lambda chapter is committed to college completion. Please sign your name to the Community College Completion Project, right over there. Our, our goal is to have 100% participation by August 9th. At the end of the program, Sarah Tyson will introduce the seminar leaders and announce the location of their seminars. In addition, the student life will provide directions on how to register for your attendance today. Hi, my name is Olivia Johnson, Vice President of Fundraising. Daniel J. Nico completed his economics PhD from George Mason University in 2008 with the field of examinations in, in constitutional, political economy, and Austri Austrian economics. In his doctoral dissertation, The Prisoner's Dilemma, the Political Economy of Proportionate Punishment was awarded the Israel Impersonal Award for Best Dissertation in Austrian Economic Study Society for the Development of Austrian Economics. In 2011, David's paper, The Prison in, in Economics, Private and Public Incarceration in Ancient Greece, was awarded the Gold Award and Tulip Prize for the best paper published in the journal Public Choice by a scholar under the age of 40. David's research has been published in a variety of scholarly outlets, including <coughs> Public Choice, Advances in Austrian Economics, the Journal of Private Enterprise, the 
disciples think that he was kind of weird. And probably rightly so. Dude was weird. He didn't have that many friends. The few he did have, he often accused of plagiarism. Um, he liked to spend a lot of time indoors, reading, writing. And if you take a look at his major book, The Wealth of Nations, commonly known as The Wealth of Nations, uh, tremendous amounts of the pages are dedicated to uh, basically accounting ledgers of grain silos, um, what, what were typically referred to as, as corn silos. Uh, apparently back in the, the Enlightenment era, England, they called grain corn. And page after page, there's just descriptive data about how much grain happened to be accumulating or going out the door uh, as a consequence of slight changes in policy. So when you read contemporary people discussing Adam Smith, he sounds like Golem from Lord of the Rings. Like, look at all the grain. <laughs> sort of creepily wringing his hands about, about stocks of grain. And for me, reading these contemporary descriptions of Smith as a sort of almost socially autistic nerd who only obsesses about material wealth and prosperity is to demonstrate that most contemporary commentators, most people writing about Adam Smith today, most people walking down the street don't understand the central point of Smith's research, still haven't grasped the importance and profound influence that material wealth has upon humanity. And Smith arguably understood this. He dedicated a number of, of, of complementary books. Not, he didn't just write the Wealth of Nations. In fact, he wrote a moral treatise before he wrote the Wealth of Nations called Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he describes where it is and how it is that human beings associate with one another through meaningful social, familial, and moral interactions. And so I would, what I want to focus a lot of today's lecture on is what are the effects, sociologically, humanely, of economic prosperity? What are the causes and consequences of material wealth? So again, Adam Smith's fuller title, what, what people often don't really pay that close of attention to, is that the fuller title of The Wealth of Nations is actually an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. With this title, just by titling this, this major treatise, this longer, fuller title. Smith basically presents and sets up the fundamental question of economic science. Can everybody hear, hear me okay if I drift away from the microphone? Yeah. Away. It's me in office. So Smith is concerned, what are the causes and consequences? Why are some countries rich and other countries poor? You look in the world and there's this tremendous amount of inequality. You can go to one country, people live in sort of shanties and huts and have barely enough to eat and no running water and no electricity. And yet, here we are in the United States, and poverty conditions in the United States include things like Xboxes. How can we explain how it is that some countries have, have, have accomplished this tremendous amount? No, it's supposed to be the echo. It's okay. Oh, okay. Um, how is it that we understand why it is that some countries are rich and other countries are poor? So that's an essential, essential project. Now, again, when, when contemporary writers basically argue that he's strange for obsessing about material wealth, I would argue that they don't really understand Smith's major contribution. They don't really understand the context in which Smith is writing it. Economic historian Deirdre McCloskey refers to this graph as the great undeniable truth of human existence. Economists, we tend to call this type of graph a hockey stick. In other words, there's a big, long, flat line for most of human history, and then a huge sort of exponential uptick in the wake of industrial society that measures material wealth in human existence. In other words, we are tremendously more wealthy today than we have been throughout the course of human civilization. Brief homework assignment. Subscribe to Netflix or go to uh, Go to Best Buy to purchase Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's a masterpiece of cinematic genius. 
if you're trying to understand economic history. For those of you guys who have never seen this movie, Keanu Reeves and some other guy are teenagers in the mid-1980s in California, and they're in a band, and they're failing history. And they travel back in time, and they pick up uh, a sort of motley crew of historical figures, Abraham Lincoln, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Socrates, who they endearingly refer to as Socrates. <laughs> now, that film conveys the basic insight of economic history which is that these obscure characters from the historic past have an easier time building social relationships, finding solidarity with one another, becoming friends, than do Bill and Ted, 1980s teenagers, with them. This makes a tremendous amount of sense. The gap in time between us and George Washington is small. Compared to the gap in time between George Washington and Julius Caesar. But the material conditions that separate Julius Caesar from George Washington are not nearly as great as the material conditions that separate George Washington from us. If you, if, presuming that they can speak the same language, if you plop down Julius Caesar with George Washington, they could both have conversations about their life experience that were relatively similar. They could both be like, I stepped in horse manure today. Yeah, me too. My friend died of tuberculosis. Yeah, me too. But the second we start saying, yeah, I took an Instagram of this and like posted a selfie, they're totally lost from the conversation. They have no point of connection with us insofar as our social experience, our humane experience, is radically different from theirs. Does anyone know what this is? Arrowhead, close. This is what's called an Australian hand axe. An arrowhead would mean that someone carved this, put it on the tip of, of, a, of a shaft, and then sort of hunted with it in some sort of complex production function. This is just a rock that someone beat against other rocks and stuff. This was the primary, if not only, tool used for millions of years for Homo erectus. Uh, as a species not radically different from ourselves. On the one hand, I, I look at this and I think, wow, it's sort of beautiful. It looks kind of like a computer mouse. There's something amazing about how human beings interact with physical resources. That it's obvious that this sort of goes in someone's hand that it was made by humans, even though it's millions of years old. On the one hand, that seems aesthetic. It seems pretty to think about that. On the other hand, I'm frightened. It scares me to think that a species with some degree of comparable human intelligence as we, as we have had no tangible technological change in the course of millions of years that left them with no other available tool or technique of accomplishing production other than just slamming rocks against other things. Compared to a computer mouse, what, I mean, computer mice we, we, we throw away within, within a few years. They become obsolete. And they, they utilize millions of constituent goods and services to go into their production. Yet for millions of years, proto-humans were stuck with this one simplistic technology. Which is to say that in the wake of industrialization, all the cool stuff in the world has happened. The, the diversity, the complexity, the material abundance that we've got has been a very, very recent and very, very fast phenomenon. So when Smith sets out to say, okay, why are some countries rich and other countries poor? We're trying to explain where it is that material wealth comes from. Economists were like the physicists of wealth. We want to know, in much the same way as a physicist studies gravity, how it is that stuff falls and operates in terms of its physical properties. Economists, we want to study wealth. We want to study material production, consumption, and distribution. And so if you want to understand that, you've got to first come to grips. You've got to develop a theory that explains the accumulation of wealth over time. The fact that we are radically wealthier today than we used to be. That's what we can call the first stylized fact. The second stylized fact is the general variance. That this accumulation of wealth has not been an equal enjoyment. Some people are much, much wealthier than other people. But what's interesting to note is that no single environment has been completely left out of this process. 
Even the poorest areas of the planet today are multiple times wealthier than they used to be 100 years ago. This is not to say that poverty does not exist. It's saying that poverty is getting systematically better with time. And that that process of, of, of growth, even amidst the, the lowest end of the, the income spectrum, has to be explained. The last stylized fact, if you were going to have a complete theory of the mechanisms of material wealth, would be things like business cycles. We're not going to talk as much about, about business cycles, but if you're going to have an understanding about why there's so much more stuff today than there used to be, and why it's accumulated in the particular places that it's accumulated, you should also be able to account if it happens to surge or fluctuate in areas from, from periods of time. So for example, in the wake of 2007, we experienced a, a financial crisis, a sort of bust in economic performance in the Western world. That would need to be included in your general theory of wealth, in, in a theory of economics. So again, I, I, I've ar I'm arguing here that Adam Smith was onto something by being so obsessed with material wealth. Economists are onto something by being so obsessed with material wealth. Smith and other economists arguably see that there is a tremendous dependence on material wealth for other things in life. The stuff that makes life worth living, in, in a sense. The, the facets of our world, like, I just want to be able to prove that money can't make me happy. Right? Give me tons of money, let me try to be happy with it, and then well, let's see if I actually believe in the adage that money can't buy can you happiness. But here, this is... This is not meant to be a joke, but, but money buys you toilet bowls. And clean sanitation and running sewage is a tremendous benefit to the human condition. In, in much of the underdeveloped world, they don't have clean sanitation. And that leads to significant rates of disease and early death and, and so on and so forth. So for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with what an economic regression is, each of these dots represent a country around the world. And on our horizontal axis, we're measuring income per capita. How much money a person in each of this, these countries, on average, earns in a year. And on the vertical axis, what we have is access to sanitation in urban areas. Whether or not you can flush a toilet bowl in a city. Towards the lower end of the spectrum, right? If, you're, if your average citizen earns less than $5,000 a year, there tend to be very few available flush toilets. Yet, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of development to basically proliferate the majority of your urban space, your city space, with clean, functioning water and sanitation. In other words, toilet bowls and running water are one of the first things you buy when you get a little bit of wealth. What else can money buy? Money can buy you an education. And in fact, a lot of people have argued that, oh, well, underdeveloped economies may lack certain cultural appreciations or cultural values. You, you tend to think that you have to go to college to make money. You have to be educated in order to become prosperous. It's not necessarily true that way. In fact, it might require some preliminary level of development for people to have the funds and resources to invest in their children. For most of human history, children had to be production units in, in household uh, farms. And as people became wealthier, it, it, it gave people the opportunity to not have their children grow crops, but instead to have their children uh, be educated, to invest quality in, in what it is that your children know and understand about the world. And so what we see is a strong correlation between primary educational enrollment and prosperity. Wealthier countries send their children to school instead of sending them to the farm. Secondary education. I mean, you, you, you presumably don't go to college unless it is the case that you've gone to preliminary education. But wealthier countries have an ability to invest more in, in secondary education, in university enrollment, than do uh, underdeveloped economies. And what you see in, in secondary education is a consistent relationship with what we pointed out earlier about the toilet bowls. Toilet bowls are very important, right? You get a little bit of development, you, you buy it right away. Secondary education is, is a little bit less important 
compared to developing agriculture, developing industry, etc. So it's one of the things that people tend to buy later in the development process. Are all of these educational benefits only retained for young people, or are we just spending money on, say, public education that doesn't really educate people? What about a real objective measure of the quality of education? Well, here we see a strong inverse relationship with adult illiteracy. So in wealthier countries, fewer adults can't read. Wealthier countries have more adults who can read. And that, again, drops off pretty quick. Right? Reading is a tremendous asset in the early stage of, of economic development. Right? You tend to invest in yourself very early on. Child malnutrition. A lot of what compelled Adam Smith to work on the, the mechanisms of wealth was precisely the fact that there are places in human history, in places around the planet even today, where people cannot afford to feed their children. And that they basically euthanize children for the sake of their own uh, material security. If you don't have enough food to eat yourself, and then there's a new baby, People sometimes would sort of throw their babies in rivers and stuff. Reading, reading old books gets really gruesome about how people interact with children. Uh, there's a, a quote in Smith where he says, where, where, where poor infants are drowned like bags filled with puppies. And I, I thought to myself, well, oh my gosh, what were they doing to puppies in the 18th century? But sure enough, that's the sort of harsh, visceral reality. Wealthier nations have much easier ability to feed children so, lifetime expectancy for, for people writ large, as well as things like infant mortality rate, tend to go down very, very quickly, right? Uh, starving children are one of those things that people really don't like to be around. And it's one of the first things that people tend to spend money on during economic development, just like education. Again, infant mortality rate. Infant mortality rate, we see this huge kink in the regression line. Largely because it's something that people are desperate to get rid of when they're underdeveloped. They're saying, if we had all the money in the world, this would be the first thing that we wouldn't allow for. And so there's not a significant variance in infant mortality between developed nations, right? Being very developed versus kind of developed is still a very, very low level of letting young children die of starvation. Yet that's a problem that plagues underdeveloped economies. And it doesn't play any significant wealthy economies, right? There's, there's no such thing as an economy with a $20,000 per year average income that allows children to start with this. It doesn't exist. Here we have life expectancy. Life expectancy is a really fascinating one because it literally means that people in wealthier economies live longer. And the gap is pretty significant. It goes from 60 to 80 years. So you get an extra 20 years on life if you happen to be in the top income percentile nation relative to the lowest income percentile nation. I realize that for college freshmen and sophomores, this, is, this doesn't resonate as much. But that's the difference between getting to meet your grandchildren. And all of my older colleagues back at Loyola, they, they say they really like that. Like, having grandkids tends to be joyous wonderful. I live most of my life trying explicitly not to have children yet. And so it seems like a backwards sort of incentive from my perspective. But sure enough, when you're old, having lots of grandkids to come and visit you and stuff is, is, is super fun, supposedly. And if you live in a forest, forest income nation, you don't get to meet them. It's sort of all of that work and effort for not. A lot of people tend to think that, that, that money and corruption go hand in hand. That wealthier economies probably have more, more political corruption, or more, um, more sort of cronyism between corporations and government. It's actually not, not, the, not the case. What you tend to see is that economic performance, high-end earnings, and, 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 and capital accumulation is actually symptomatic of relative fair and transparent political rule systems. So those things tend to go hand in hand. It also means that people with uh, productive capacity and wealth in their hands can use it to reform political processes to be more fair and equitable. So this is what's called the Transparent, Transparency International Corruption Index. 
This is a, an index designed by political scientists to measure the amount of transparency in political processes. Whether or not you can just sort of run for election, or whether or not you have to sort of grease wheels with bribes or nepotism or things like that. And so what's interesting is that these are political scientists. They're not necessarily interested in measuring wealth per se, but teams of economists said, oh, I wonder what the relationship between this transparency index is with, with material wealth around the globe. And sure enough, there's this very strong and positive correlation that fits with this broad pattern that we're starting to see. It seems that wealthy economies tend to be places that have societies that are characterized by a lot of other good stuff, right? There's not piles of dead babies, there's like decent amounts of food, people live longer, there's flush toilets. I mean, I like all of those things. And sure enough, they tend to be wealthier. Now, the big question in contemporary dialogues is about inequality. And inequality is probably an area where there isn't a strong relationship. It's not, it's not clear which way the concept of inequality runs with prosperity and wealth. On the one hand, there's good reason to think that a wealthier society will probably have more inequality. And this is especially true when we're talking about globalization. We're talking about globally connected networks. It used to be that you couldn't sell goods and services to a global audience. Any of you guys watch the show Mad Men? You. It takes place in like the 1960s. Everybody has these sort of vintage, vintage outfits and it looks very chic. It's a fun show to watch. But what you should realize is that when people lived in the 1960s and 70s and had these sort of vintage chic fashions, they were all predominantly made and manufactured in the United States. Access to global markets was very, very limited at that time. So when I go to Starbucks and I stand in line and I order a cup of coffee, the coffee was oftentimes grown in like Kenya or Colombia. The cash register was probably designed and manufactured in Japan or China. The espresso machine that they make it on was like manufactured in Italy. And the person behind the counter could have been born in the United States or Puerto Rico or any number of other countries. My participation in that trade is a globalized and multicultural experience that my own parents, when they were my age in the 1960s and 70s, did not have access to. The material goods and services that you had access to could only be made and sold and transported in the United States. Yes, you could get some international goods and services, but you had to pay a significant premium for them. And in order to get them here, it took a tremendous amount of red tape and bureaucracy. Mad Men brings this home because the, the main character's wife hosts an international party, and she's, she's, she's razzling all of her guests by showing, and we brought beer all the way from Holland, and it's a bowl full of Heineken. Heineken was a, was a major import. Oh my goodness, you got beer all the way from Heineken. From, from Holland, but it's tiny. Could you imagine what it would be like if, if you could only have beer from the United States? It would mean that there was no other beer essentially than like Bud Light and Miller Light. Now, I, I realize college students are like, that's fine with me. But people like myself, that's like Apollo. And it's frightening in so far as people weren't like outraged at the time. People were tickled just to get beer from Holland. It shows the, the way in which people would be complicit towards that. But in a global market, you can imagine if you come up with a new beer and selling it to an international audience, you can get really rich really quick. So if Bill Gates or Steve Jobs invented what they invented, but in 1930 or 1940, there's a limited market that they can sell it to. So they can't get as rich back then. So allowing for that global access means that you could have more inequality then. On the other hand, more wealthy environments tend to allow more opportunity for lower income individuals within a country to, to grow out of their low income status. So what we see is no strong correlation either way between what's called the Gini coefficient, a measure of inequality within a country, and the degree of wealth in the country. But we'll talk more about this concept of inequality uh, as time, time goes on. 
In other words, economists tend to have uncertainty regarding the causes and consequences of inequality, but we have a lot of very strong certainty about net material wealth. We don't necessarily know how to guarantee proportions of the pie. But we do know what causes growth in the net pot. And having even a small share, or even a shrinking share, of a growing pot can oftentimes be a net preferable than having a growing share of a shrinking or static pot. that allowed for this massive accumulation of wealth and the things that separate in social conditions the rich from the poor at the global level. It's, it's predominantly a technological one. It's innovation. It's, it's things that save us time. Homo erectus bashed rocks against other rocks with, with hand axes. And that's pretty much all that they had. Inventing something preferable, inventing industrialization, inventing tools and machines that do work for us more easily and cheaper is, is one of the major driving forces of economic prosperity, of where wealth comes from. Now, what, what this shows us, this graph, is how economists tend to measure real terms. So on the left we have times in 1920. What does this mean? It means how long it would take you if you worked at the average wage rate in 1920. Right? This is a way for controlling for inflation. If you worked at the average wage rate in 1920 for 37 minutes, that's how long it took you to afford a half a gallon of milk in 1920 prices. Now, people probably remember their grandparents or something saying, I used to pay a nickel for a gallon of milk. Right? That's inflation. We have, we have higher priced goods and services today. But what you make, what you earn, is different too. So using time at work at an average wage rate is a common denominator. It's an easy way to cut through this sort of vagueness that is inflation. So notice here, in 1920, you go to work, you work for 37 minutes. 37 minutes. So then you can afford a half a gallon of milk. At today's wages, if, if average wages are about $10 an hour, that would mean that a half a gallon of milk was about $5 if you were 37 minutes. It's not exactly correct, but it's, it's sort of close. But actually, if you fast forward to 1997, average wages are so high and milk so affordable that it only takes seven minutes. You go to work at the average work and you work seven minutes, and you can afford a half a gallon of milk. So you cut the costs of milk as far as how much you have to go to work for it in, 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 in a fraction of itself. This, this holds true for a basket of variety of goods and services. A gallon of gas used to cost us 32 minutes of work at average wages in 1920. By 1997, it only costs five minutes. 100 miles of air travel, right? To be able to fly somewhere used to basically be reserved for rich people. But now, even uh, ordinary workers can, can only spend an hour's worth of labor at work to be able to afford uh, 100 miles of air travel. A pair of jeans, right? Could you imagine working 10 hours of work, like more than a day, more than a day of work, and you can only afford a, a, a pair of Levi's? Now, you can get that before you take lunch at your job. This is in part because of a growing diversity of goods and services. Going to work today means that you work alongside capital resources, tools and materials that make your productivity as a worker more influential, more productive, which is a, a major function of how globalized and, and interconnected our market economy is. So, when asking these questions, what causes all of these processes? How is it that wealth actually comes about? Smith's answer was pretty straightforward. He said, little else, is, little else is requisite to carry a nation from barbarism to opulence, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. Now, contemporary economists 
Douglas North. Douglas North won the Nobel Prize for basically saying the same thing as Adam Smith said in 1776. He just said it like 300 years later. They gave him a million dollars. But he says, institutions, right? Institutions are things very similar to these easy taxes and tolerable administration of justice. Rules of the game and their enforcement. If, if people have stable political and economic institutions, they tend to trade and prosper more significantly than if they don't. Now, that's an interesting hypothesis. But it leaves us at what I call the porno theory of institutions. Meaning that contemporary new institutional economists define institutions no differently as the Supreme Court of the United States defined pornography. They know it when they see it. Good institutions are better than bad institutions. That doesn't really get us anywhere. It's not very useful. The question, the more important question that people were obviously wondering is, well, how the heck do we get good institutions? How do we grow them? How do we protect them? How do we foster them? How do we encourage them? But before you can hope to understand a theory of how to grow and protect and encourage good institutions for economic prosperity, you probably need a way to measure and understand institutional change. So bunches of economists sat around and said, how can we measure, how can we measure good institutions for bad institutions? And one of the first people to actually go about doing this is this guy, Fernando de Soto, not the, not the conquistador or explorer from years of old. This is a, a, a modern practicing development economist. And he said, imagine a country where nobody can identify who owns what. But addresses, like where you live, cannot be easily verified. People cannot be made to pay their debts. Resources cannot conveniently be turned into money. Ownership cannot be divided into shares. Descriptions of assets are not standardized. They cannot be easily compared. And the rules that govern property vary. So in this society, when you buy a car, there's no proof that you own it. When you live in a house, there's no title on who owns the house or the land that it's on. Meaning that people can sort of take it from you or, 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 or damage it, and there's no way for you to easily get recourse. This is a huge impediment to economic prosperity because it means that people have a very difficult time planning and investing for the future. Now, Bernardo de Soto spent a significant amount of time traveling in foreign countries and noticing that compared to wealthy environments, compared to places like the United States, compared to developed economies, it was really hard to own stuff, to buy something, to prove that you own it. And so what he really wanted to do is, is measure. What if, what if we knew how much easier it was to own and trade and, and, and begin business operations in a developed economy? And what if we had a scale with which we could place countries of how easy it was to accomplish these trades relative to other countries. And so, he actually, what he tried to do was go into other countries to start businesses or to do basic business transactions. And this, this graph is very hard to see, but that's sort of the point. He started in countries like Haiti, the Philippines, and, the, and Peru, and said, okay, I'm gonna start a business, or I'm gonna buy and sell some real estate, and see how easy that, that gets done. And one of the first things he said was, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay any bribes, I'm gonna do everything legitimately, how it's supposed to be done. And one of the first things he found out is that if you don't pay bribes in certain countries, you don't get things done. And so what this diagram represents is the processes that he had to go through and different bureaucratic organizations operated by government in order to obtain a sales contract following a five-year lease. So you have a, a building lease and you want to be able to, to sell things out of it. You need a license to, to operate a business license. It takes, in this diagram, 111 steps through different bureaucracies, sometimes repeating the same bureaucratic office several times, uh, in 4,112 days. 4,000 days, several years before you can open a business in, uh, this is in Haiti. Here he did something similar regarding, uh, let's say you've been living on a, on a space of land in a certain uh, dwelling for a period of time, and you want to formalize that ownership, you want a deed 
if you want a title to the land, how do you get that formal recognition? Uh, this is in the Philippines. It, it, it took comparably several hundred steps and, 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 and years of operations. And you see similar things across all environments that have very, very low economic performance. In other words, the more steps and the more difficult they, they, that certain institutional rules and procedures take it to own stuff, to sell stuff, to hire people and fire people, the less amount of economic operations you're going to have. The less amount of trade, the less amount of investment, the less amount of material productivity thereafter. So, again, we were sort of mired in this pornographic theory of institutions. We know good institutions when we see them. Good institutions are countries that have vibrant economies. They have stable money supplies. They have sound private property rights regimes. They have fair and equitable elections. And they avoid things like corruption and nepotism and things like that. And underperforming economies tend to be uh, almost totalitarian at times. They tend to have excessively expanded bureaucracies. They tend to have very, very complicated ways of doing business and owning assets. So we know the good from the bad. But we still lack a sort of systematic and consistent way of measuring the good from bad. To sort of, sort of led, led the way, we can't send teams of economists to every country to try to do every type of business so that we can get an index for this. But sure enough, teams of economists at, at the, the Fraser Institute is an economic think tank centered in Vancouver. Um, and they've compiled what's called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. And it's comprised of these five different measures. Size of government, degree of regulation, the soundness of money, the amount of free trade, and the rule of law. And I, the way I explain this to my students is that it's not like judging figure skating at the, at the Olympics, right? Someone gets up and they do a triple axel and everybody says, oh, that was so pretty, you get a 10, right? It's not that economists just look at economies and they say, oh, you're prosperous, you get a 10, we like you. It's instead that these are real objective measures of economic performance. So the size of government is typically the proportion of your gross domestic product that's subjected to taxation, or the amount of spending that your government does as a real measure compared to the private sector economy. Um, so what we have is an index that can give a quantifiable measure of how free an economy is in different places. And what we see is that this index has a very meaningful relationship with prosperity at large and all of the social effects that we saw in the previous regressions. Economic freedom and economic prosperity tend to go hand in hand. If you have lots of opportunities and lots of accommodation for trade and investment, you tend to get more trade and investment. You tend to get more development and all of the extra sort of social beneficial things that come with wealth. Furthermore, Different teams of economists have independently created their own indices of economic freedom and come up with similar results. There's the Heritage Foundation has a separate economic freedom index. The Mercatus Center at George Mason University has a separate index of economic freedom. And the World Bank has recently purchased an index from a team of economists at Harvard called the Doing Business Index that's effectively measuring the same thing. And all of these things have consistent and stable relationships with all the sort of things that I'm about to show you. Economic freedom tends to be positively correlated with all the good things that we saw previously correlated with economic wealth. Income per, pack, per capita, life expectancy, environmental performance. A lot of people are very concerned that capitalism deteriorates the environment. The evidence shows the actual opposite to be true. Life satisfaction. So even though, even though we say proverbial things like money can't buy you happiness, Actually, when people have money, they tend to report that they are happier. Shocking. Uh, corruption events, right? You, you get better scores on corruption events, meaning less corruption, when you tend to have more economic freedom. Income per capita of the poor is 10%. So the adage that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer does not seem to hold with regard to economic freedom. In fact, the poorest 25% of the population are typically $10,000 per year better off under economic freedom than they are under non-economically free conditions. It's better to be poor in a rich society than to be poor in a poor society. That just seems true. Civil liberties ratings. So measurable indexes that measure how well off 
ethnic minorities and women's rights are in various different countries, economic significantly better than non-economically free countries, and it's a consistent relationship down the scale. Furthermore, economically free environments have lower unemployment ratings, lower children in the workforce, and less infant mortality. And this gives you a sense of the, the degree and shape of the slopes that are associated in all of these correlations. Again, happiness is a strong positive correlation with economic freedom. But also just sort of main things, like there fewer people get shot in economically free countries. There's less violent homicide under economic freedom than there is under more controlled and regulated economies. Gender inequality events. Okay, so this is typically a measure of like everything from wage gaps to how many opportunities there are in educational systems for women, uh, whether or not women can be elected into office, whether or not women have the right to vote or own property. Economically free environments, the most economically free environments, have significantly less gender inequality than the least economically free environments. And it's a consistent relationship across the board. Uh, this is uh, women in secondary education and women in executive positions or political offices. We tend to see uh, beneficial effects from economic freedom uh, with regard to seats in parliament, uh, as well as the maternal mortality rate. If you're going to be pregnant and give birth, it's, it's much better to, to do so in an economically free environment than it is in a non economically free environment. Significantly higher rates of death during birth for women in least economically free, and it's all but eradicated in the most economically free environments. Some people think that free economies are more volatile, that they're more subject to business cycles or unemployment rates or things like our financial crisis, but it's also not necessarily true according to the data that we have. More economically free environments tend to be less volatile in terms of whether or not the stock market moves or busts according to, to cyclical changes. Again, with environmental uh, effects, things like CO2 emissions, this is a sort of ambiguous relationship, similar to the inequality. It's obvious that a wealthier economy with more stuff is going to have a higher net carbon emissions. Right? If you don't have any cars, you're not going to emit any CO2. So that's not surprising. But the question should be more about whether or not CO2 emissions are used efficiently at the per capita rate. In other words, if you have some degree of development, it's better that you have uh, economic uh, prosperity because it's going to be a measure of how efficiently you're using your carbon emissions per capita. Uh, in other words, that per person within a developed economy, you're responsible for a far lesser carbon footprint than you are in a less developed economy. In other words, it takes a lot of burning of carbon fuels to get industrialization to become developed. But once you are, you tend to use those uh, sort of pollution credits, if you will, more efficiently. And you can see this, that, that by increasing your per unit uh, gross domestic product, you actually decrease carbon emissions over time in the United States. Similarly with sulfur oxide, nitrous oxide, organic water pollutants, etc. So lots of times at this point in the presentation, people ask me, these are all very nice correlations. Yes, wealth goes along with a lot of cool stuff. But how do we know causation? To test the causation, what we would ideally want to show is that there's some sample of countries that have improved their rating in economic freedom, that have increased the level of their sort of capital, um, capitalism amount of trade and prosperity, and some other sample of countries that didn't. And then we would want to compare what's happened across those two samples. And it would give us a sense as to what you can really get out of improving your score on the economic freedom index versus not. And sure enough, we have decent data on that. We, since the 1970s, like I said, my consumer experience at Starbucks is radically more economically free than my parents was at my age. They lived in a relatively constrained economy where global trade was far less frequent. We, you and I, we use goods and services, like I don't know where this is made, but probably China or Japan. Um, my parents didn't have access to that many goods and services that were made abroad. So globally, we've experienced a tremendous amount of increased economic freedom in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And globally, since 2000, we've experienced a decline in economic freedom. And so if we can map onto those sort of periods of change, some sort of tractable pattern that can give us insight as to how it is that economic freedom 
causes or, or contributes to these subsequent social processes. And sure enough, if you look at all the countries, just the countries that improve their economic freedom, right? We, we, we see this global growth of, of measured capitalism according to the economic freedom index. This is from 1980 to 2005. All the countries in the world, on average, got more free. As a result of getting more free, they all got wealthy. Right? We said no one has been completely left out of the prosperity since the 1980s. Some have earned it more unequally than others, but that's not to say that being twice as wealthy as you were 30 years ago isn't very, very important. Life expectancy also grew when we only look at the countries that increased their ranking. Right? So if you're in the in the sample of countries that increase your ranking on the economic freedom of the world index, you got an extra four to five years of life. Right? Starting in the 1980s, you tended to die between 62 and 63. Now that we live in the, in the mid 2000s, you live between 67 and 68. People became more educated in economic freedom countries. Right? On average, between 4.6 and 4.8 years, but now you're going to school an extra two years. Just in the just in the in, in the few decades that we've manipulated or increased this economic freedom since the 1980s. Similarly, economically free countries improve their democratic indices, how well their democracies function, how fair their elections are, how uh, less volatile their, their political conflicts are. Now, if you compare the countries that became more economically free with the sample of countries that didn't, right? So any, any country that didn't change their economic freedom since 1980, what happened to their per capita? Well, it's just sort of cut it along. We had a huge positive uptick in the countries that improved their measured rate of economic freedom, yet countries that didn't basically lost out on three decades worth of growth, which meant that their life expectancy in fact, decline. This isn't a, a tremendously strong correlation, but in context of the extra five to three years that we got in the economic freedom, these people are basically becoming debtor soon as a consequence of not fixing their trade policies. We see positive effects in schooling, but not nearly as positive as those effects that we saw in the economic freedom system. Similar with, with the democracy performance. So remember, we measure economic freedom in terms of size of government, regulation, sound money, free trade, and rule of law. Interestingly enough, like I said, since 2000, there's been a radically de global decline in economic freedom. And I want to talk a little bit about the American experience and how significant that seems to be. So since 1960 to 2010, real government spending in the United States has radically grown. The question remains, how does this affect economic freedom in the United States? Furthermore, one way to think of it is the ratio of the private to the public sector. So average growth in the private sector was about 3%, and growth in the public sector a little bit higher than that from 1946 to 2009. But just in the tail end of this time period, right, just from 2000 to 2009, this last nine years in the wake of, of 2000, public sector growth has radically uh, been greater than private sector growth. Private sector growth near 1%. Public sector growth 4%. The public sector, government bureaucracies, Department of Motor Vehicles, other forms of public education, etc., they're growing at a rate four times the private sector. So jobs at Google and Apple and other sorts of private sector operations grow slower in the wake of 2000 than do public sector operations. Projected government spending as a share of GDP, government spending is estimated to, to, to grow to 80% of GDP by the end of the century. In 2000, right, the economic freedom of the world index has been recorded, right, we started measuring it in the late 1970s. It's been recorded year after year by compiling data from all of these different countries. And typically from, from its dawn of, of development, the United States ranked like in the top three. One, two were the trade places between us and, and Hong Kong. Meaning it was the most easiest place in the world to start a business. It's the most easiest place in the world to buy goods and services from a 
country, to open up a factory, to sell goods and services, to contract with employees, to fire someone, to hire new people, etc. In 2008, so this is just the regulatory component of the economic freedom things. How much government regulation stands in your way from starting a business? By 2008, on just that sub-margin of economic freedom, the United States fell from number two to number 17. So in other words, the amount of regulation in the United States for opening a business in 2008 is more arduous than it is in Canada, Denmark, the Bahamas, New Zealand, Singapore, Belize. In other words, if you just want to sort of open business without being concerned necessarily about uh, regulation and compliance, it's easier to do it in all of these other countries relative to the United States. Now, 17 is still really good compared to like 150 other countries in the world, but it shows that we're getting outpaced necessarily on where it is ideal and easiest to open new business operations. By 2009, so notice the change. From 2000 to 2008, so it took us eight years to fall 15 spaces. But in a single year, we, we fell an additional 10 spaces. It's been an accelerated free fall in these measured reports of how it is that the United States governs and regulates business operations. Our overall economic freedom index in 2000 was number three. By 2008, we had fallen to six. And again, in a single year, we fell from 6 to 10 in 2009. Today, the latest, the latest numbers that we have available represent 2013. We hover around number 12. People typically think that Canada, Canada has like large social, social welfare programs, uh, subsidized and, and governmental health care. They must be worse than us in terms of economic freedom. Not true. Canada has a stable tax rate and much more uh, open international trade than the United States now. Largely because we've radically changed our policies on these things since 2000. So my main question to sort of leave you guys with is if there is this strong relationship between the social qualities of life, right, how happy, healthy, long you live, how equitable and fair things are for minorities, how easy life conditions are for the poorest among, among us. If those things do in fact depend upon prosperity, and prosperity does in fact depend upon economic freedom, is there a concern that our current quality of life in the United States will come into touch with our declining economic freedom? We are now on par with countries like Estonia for economic freedom. It is a very different living experience to live in Estonia than it is in the United States. And one question that could, could be is how long will it be before the lifestyle factors and the sociological effects of economic freedom to catch up with this declining rate? Thank you guys so much for paying attention and listening. This is a, I don't even know what these things are called, but if you take a picture of this with your phone, it'll take you to a website where you can peruse the Economic Freedom Index yourself. We have country briefs for every country around the world, and the data that dates back all the way to 1970. So if you're doing reports for your classes, or if you're just interested about the countries that you yourself have visited or have friends who live in, you can look at them and see and understand what subcomponent uh, is responsible for their high or low ranking. It's a lot of fun to look at. Thanks, everyone. Sorry about that. Dr. Amigo, thank you for your presentation. I am Karen Harris, Vice President of Scholarship. Your presentation provides a great introduction to today's seminar. And for now, well, for the Rihanna Carpenter, to make a presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Thank you. All right. Uh, I am Brianna Harkins. I am the president of the Asian College Business Club. The mission of the business club is to support and promote free markets and free people. Uh, I would like to thank Phi Theta Kappa for allowing us to sponsor this year's keynote speaker, uh, provided by, funding provided by the Koch Institute, who also promotes the mission of supporting and promoting freedom and free markets. I would also like to thank Dr. Domenico for taking the time to speak to us on the importance of economics and freedom how freedom can make us all better off. I would like to present you with this year's Business Club t-shirt.